this lecture will be a little quick and dirty on the um, muscle information that you need to know for the exam. Uh, also, still make sure you're looking at your PowerPoints and reading your text, uh, because I'm not going to cover every single thing. So, remember, it's your responsibility to make sure you're looking up some information. So let's, uh, let's get right into this. Uh, tendons and ligaments, very important structures to understand. Ligaments are going to do what? If you haven't read, all right, it's going to connect bone to bone. Our example, the ACL connects the femur and the tibia. Ligaments are non, contractile structures. They cannot contract. The only thing that can contract are going to be our muscles. So our tendons, what happens here with them? They connect bone to muscle. So when the muscle contracts, it pulls on the tendon and then that pulls on the muscle. So you could say, for example, the patellar tendon be a great example of the quads pulling on the patellar tendon too, then pull on the tibia. Now I want you to pay attention to the picture here to understand a concept that we'll continue to talk about, especially next term when we get into healing. Tendons have fibers that go parallel to each other because you want the force to be straight. So you, want, you don't want squiggly um, tendon fibers because that will not give you the best strength. You want all that force that's generated by a muscle to be pulled through the same direction through the tendon. It's gonna give you maximum force. With a ligament, however, you want it to be squiggly. You want it to be able to resist forces from multiple directions. So when you contract the muscle, you want your bone to move in one direction. So your tendon needs to have parallel lineup. And if you've injured your tendon, we'll talk about how we can try to help in the healing process to make sure that occurs. And in healing of a ligament, we wanna make sure this type of formation occurs so that it can withstand forces from multiple angles. We'll talk a lot more about that later, but just a real quick run over on that. When thinking about muscles, we should be thinking about the line of pull. This tells us what action is gonna be performed by the muscle. So if we go down here and we look at muscle A, you know what that is? That is your levator scapula. So your levator is A. So if we look at its line of pull here, what is it going to do? Now, when we get to each one of these sections of the body, we'll talk more in depth about what's happening. But we should be able to see that it's going to laterally bend the head to the left, so lateral flexion. It's also going to cause rotation of the cervical spine, which will then, of course, turn the skull, <clears throat> and it's gonna to rotate to the same side that it's pulling on, and it will also help extend the cervical spine. All of that we can figure out just by knowing where it attaches, <clears throat> both ends, and then you just pull those points together and that's gonna give you your line of pull. So it's important that as we go through each um, joint and all the muscles there that we understand the line of pull so we understand the actions and then the best way to stretch them as well. So length tension relationship, and this right here is dealing more with a strength component. So what I want to point out with this guy is that if a muscle's too long, let's say like D here, we're going to get what's called active insufficiency. And I'm going to have a whole nother video on that here that you'll get to watch. But D is like this right here. Your sarcomeres and your filaments within those are too far apart to have a contraction of any real strength. Remember, these are the sliding filaments of the sliding filament theory. So here are your sliding filaments. So when you're trying to contract a muscle, if it's already really stretched out, you're not going to get maximum strength. So what do we want? We want to try to find this BC range where we have the most strength. You can see here there's the most overlap occurring in the B and C range. So it's going to be able to get the most 
force generated. And if it's too short and already contracted, like you see in A here, then you're also not gonna be able to generate force. So when we're doing MMT, we're trying to position the muscle in the BC range so that we can see what their maximum strength would be. If you position someone in a short or extra long situation, they're always gonna score lower than they would if they were in the middle. Uh, the ov overload principle, quickly bringing this up, there'll be at least one question on the exam about it. This is how you strengthen a muscle. We'll talk a ton more about this next term when we actually do strengthening. But the principle of it is, if you don't overload the muscle past what it's used to resisting, it will never get stronger. And when we talk more about this, you'll understand why when people go to the gym and they do three sets of 10 or four sets of 10, they're actually not getting themselves stronger. They're working on endurance, not strength. So if you're always lifting 100 pounds, guess how strong you're gonna be? Strong enough to lift 100 pounds. Now, you might do that 100 times, so you're going to be good at lifting 100 pounds 100 times. But if you want to get to lift 101 pounds, what do you need to do? Lift 101 pounds one time. The only way you get stronger is by challenging those muscles. Then we get some key um, uh, vocabulary terms for muscles. So let's look at agonist versus antagonist here. So the antagonist is the muscle that is being stretched when the agonist contracts. So let's just take the knee joint. With the knee, if you're extending the knee, the agonist would be the quadricep muscles. The antagonist, hamstrings. Or if we're flexing the elbow, we have biceps. Antagonist, triceps. And then you just reverse those if you do elbow extension, for example, uh, or you do a hamstring curl. Now the quads become the, ag or the antagonist. So the antagonist to agonist relationship is just whichever muscle is contracting is the agonist. Whichever muscle needs to relax so you can have that motion is your antagonist. Then we have stabilizers. All these muscles do at the time that they're being contracted is to help stabilize a joint so there can be more movement. So an example of this is your supraspinatus in your shoulder. So this is gonna to help depress the head of the humerus into the glenoid fossa to allow for other movement. So great stabilizing muscle. And again, everything is gonna be talked about more in depth as we continue to move on through the body. Force couple. So this is where you have multiple muscles. You're gonna need three generally that are gonna help with rotation. So for this, uh, if you look at upward rotation of the scapula, of the scapula, you actually need three muscles to contract to get that rotation. <clears throat> so take a look in your book for the different muscles involved in upward and downward rotation. And that's your example of your force couple there. <clears throat> And then last, we have synergists. These are muscles that work together to do an action. Example, all four of your quads. Remember, the quads is just a general term for four muscles, but all four of those work together to cause knee extension. Uh, you could also look at the bicep and the anterior delt. We're gonna help with shoulder flexion. Tons of muscles help each other out. So what we really need to have is a combination of all these things. Um, to flex the shoulder, for example, you have your agonist, which I talked about down here, which are your bicep anterior delt to flex the shoulder. And those two muscles are not only agonists, but they're synergists because they're working together. And that means the posterior delt and the triceps need to be um, relaxed. So they are the antagonist. Then the supraspinatus is gonna stabilize the head of the humerus. And then, like I said, your little um, check the book out on your own question. 
Then you also have three muscles that are going to help with upward rotation of the scapula. All of those things are required to just do shoulder flexion. So I think it's really incredible to think about that, uh, just to kind of give you an appreciation of all the things that need to go into play just to do one motion.